So that, that's um, interesting because, you know, we, we both have clients that, um, you know, ahead of a sale, their tax planning technique is I'm moving to a tax friendly state. Right. And, and they do that because they want to, you know, the state income tax could be a significant bite depending on where you live. So, you know, and, and they may not really want to move there, but they're doing it from a tax perspective. You know, they're, again, of course, they're out of the, now they're not in their community any longer. Now they're away from their kids, their grandkids. Maybe they have an ailing parent uh, or so. And what I'm hearing from you is, is like, you know, just you don't know what you don't know. Right. So you need to seek good, sound advice from a tax perspective, yes. like this, like yourself with Ink Trust. And if you're in one of these states that you mentioned, and there's sounds like about 15 or 20 of them, that you could set this up, you can invest the money, you know, to, to set this up. And then once you sell that company, you're still living in the, you're, where you want to live. And you, you're, you're deferring or eliminating any state in, in, income tax implications. Right. You're looking at the revenues, you're looking at expenses. And of course, um, almost every deal we work on, uh, you know, middle market, low market, we have the ad backs. Right. Justification, rationale, uh, verification, whatever you want to call it. Right. So, you know, we're, we, we have, when we get bids in from uh, potential buyers, some buyers will say, okay, we accept your ad backs. And this is what our, our price is going to be. This is our multiple times your adjusted profits. And this is what we're willing to pay. We have other that come in and say, look, we're a little skeptical of like a couple, three items here. And so we're not going to include that in our, uh, our valuation, but they're multiples higher. So you still come with the same number. But I know from experience uh, that, you know, buyers really are focusing on certain aspects. Okay. You're adding back this because of why, which is laid out in the materials, but is that really something you're comfortable with from a buyer perspective, which could come be a challenging conversation if they decide they're not comfortable with it down the road. You know, involuntary could be that there's just no buyers. Right. Right. Because how can you not have a buyer for my business? Right. No one ever thinks about that because you're, you're in your silo, you're running your company. So again, I'll give you a quick example, and I'd love to hear you know uh, from you as well. Uh, you know, we get I get calls a lot from you know client potential clients referrals to us, and I, you know, if it's not a fit for our auction process, how we work and how we help owners sell through, you know, we try to help them somewhere else, right? Maybe right. Uh, introduce them to somebody that's handles you know, smaller companies, or give them a couple ideas that they can move forward with. Yeah, I think you know, I think you know. It's under it's understanding. It's also understanding, uh, uh, understanding the market, right? Understanding the buyer pool, and you know, from an Osage, and I know our whole team adheres to this, is that really understanding why they're coming to us, what's motivating uh, the sell, and what are your goals and objectives, right? I mean, you could be uh, uh, you could be the second generation and the third generation still working in the business, but you decided that hey, I need to provide for myself and my spouse, so I need to sell. Or maybe I'll sell a recap. I'll sell out a big piece, but leave some in for my kids to continue to run because that's what they choose to do. Or you may have one kid in the business that, or a child in business that wants to stay on and grow it. And another person, a child in business who's not in the business, but is also looking for a payday. So there's a lot of dynamics going on in no particular order. Obviously, interest rates are up. So the cost of capital is more. So that's affecting valuations. If you can even get the financing, um, the stole some issues with the supply chain, uh, people, a little bit disruption. So not quite sure how that's going to affect my business long term. Do I have too much inventory? Do I not have enough inventory? You know, what's the proper amount of inventory? You know, those are kind of questions like, you know, normal business cycles. We haven't had a normal business cycle and like since pre pandemic. So these things are constantly on the mind of buyers and play into whether or not they want to do a deal. Um, inflation has a big impact. And of course, number one and two on the list are labor. Everybody, we have what, six million job openings of the last report. Uh, when it comes to skilled labor, it's probably bigger holes to fill in manufacturing and technology, et cetera. And that's a big concern to buyers. But the number one reason that we're hearing from the buyer community why deals have slowed down is that a visibility and what's ahead of us. 
you know, you bring up a, a, a very interesting point uh, because, you know, early stage investing, institutional capital is coming in at the onset of the business, right? The owner is willing to give up, our ownership group is willing to give up a significant amount of equity to bring in uh, cash, but not just cash, also resources, right? So yes. you you look at one thing, but you, you, you have your own, everybody lives their own little island of how they run their companies, but they don't look at the broader perspective of the market and what other resources are out there. Not because, it could be just because they just don't know that these other resources are available. They give you a whole different uh, perception or look or the light bulb goes on that could help you build your business, right? So when I look at it from early stage, like where you played a lot with some very successful businesses, you know, maybe touch a little bit on that because, you know, money's one thing. But but the but the human capital piece, the Rolodex, uh, the relationships you bring into early stage, and, and again, you're spending money, right? You're looking, you're you're investing in the growth, and you may not be profitable for three to five years. But the fact is, is that certain economic trends, certain uncertainties, have slowed it. Kind of normalize it, in fact. I mean, if you look back prior to like the mid, you know, 14, mid 2014, 15, 16, deal flow was kind of getting back to those levels or at those levels. The deals done in 19, throw away 20 because it was a pandemic year, but 21 and 22 were really historic levels of deal flow. So it's kind of getting back to like a normalization. And that's kind of where we are in 23. People have, you know, tend to have short memories. They don't think historically long term. I mean, to kind of correlate it, if you look at it, interest rates are 7%. Mortgage, 7, 7.5%. When I took my first mortgage out, it was 14%. And then I refinanced to 10.5%. And then I got a 15-year mortgage at 7%, and I was thrilled. It's a good point, because what you're, what you're talking about there, it's a, uh, you know, lack of better, it's like a soft landing, right? You are able to take some chips off the table, but you're also able to continue working on the things you like to do. And yes. in all honesty, you know, and, and you know, sellers, excuse me, uh, you know, that's a win-win in the right circumstance. That's why we vet the buyer pool and let that have them do their own due diligence on the buyer pool to make sure to talk to other companies they bought, CEOs of the companies, uh, see how, how things transition, how things work for them. You know, but from a buyer perspective, you know, I think sometimes our clients uh, maybe don't think about this enough is that the buyers really want you to stay on in a capacity. You know, whether you're driving sales, while you're driving, uh, uh, you know, a pet project, while you're driving acquisitions. What happens is you're going to get, a, a, my opinion, this is my opinion, you're going to get a, like an equalization. You're going to have a great big buyer pool and a great big seller pool at the same time. So you're going to see some more normalization. I mean, obviously, it's going to cause some um, valuation expectations to be tempered a bit um, due to things we talked about, uncertainty, interest rates, et cetera. But a multiple that maybe this time last year, and I have st statistics on this, that would last year at this time maybe trade at a six to seven multiple, is now trading at a five to six multiple. Today, there's all kinds of buyers out there. And one of the things we addressed way back when, I think it was maybe our first episode, is the types of buyers. So we're all getting the phone calls, right? You're getting calls from, hey, we got buyers for your business. Hey, I represent so-and-so. We'd like to talk to you about maybe buying your business um, or directly from a company that you compete with. Um, or is in your industry on that line, I, I, you know, there, there's a certain time when patience runs out on the early stage, right? I mean, venture fund, venture capital by its nature is risk capital, right? You're going to, you may invest a hundred million dollars in 10 different deals. And one of them, that hundred million dollars becomes a billion dollars, but the other nine just don't go anywhere. I mean, it could be three or four of them or five or six of them just kind of plot along as small little companies and just, just never really, gain hold and a couple may fail. I'm hearing from you, there's several techniques 
that will provide the cash flow? Because a big question for most of our clients and your clients is, will I have enough money post sale to live the life I'm accustomed to? Right. I don't want to short myself or my family. I also don't want to shift a huge portion of the proceeds of sale to whether it be federal or state taxes. And it's all about cash flow post sale. And you know, we're trying to avoid surprises. Right. I mean, the key, the key, the key thing about planning is that you don't and, and, and you don't you want to limit it to surprises in a transaction. So if a business owner is not thinking about this, uh, hasn't engaged with the right uh, trusted advisors like yourself or me, uh, and all of a sudden he gets to the table after spending a lot of money and he realizes he has a huge tax liability. You know, he may walk away because, hey, I, I can't do this because there's no money left for me or not enough left for me and my family. So what I'm hearing from you is and, and of course. What's happening here is, is that you have, it's a family. So you're the second generation or third generation is thinking about, well, I'm just going to take the business o- over. My parents are going to give me the stock and, you know, but and their parents are saying, well, what am I going to live off of? Right? So what I'm hearing from you, and these are, again, these are, these are, these are favorable um, elements of the tax code that could be implemented. It's critical for both the seller perspective and the buyer perspective. And it's, you know, we have a deal right now where um, it's in medical field, a medical, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing to do uh, various parts. And we have a, a client that, you know, they, they had a, a softness, but it's just a temporary downturn. I mean, the customer's going to come back, but say, hey, put, put things on hold for right now. And the buyer's like, okay, we, we still like the deal. Um, and we either can structure something now that we you know, pay it down, out down the road in an earn out, or we can just, let's let things, this table things for six months. And then when it comes back, we'll go back at it. But I think, you know, it's not like uh, pe- people tend to think, and that's why you hire uh, firms like us and you, it's not a, you're not trying to be uh, confront, right, or confrontational with, you're trying to just, you raise issues that come up. And it, it, it just, it's, it's facts, right? We're talking about numbers. So it's pretty much black and white. But if, you ra- if you're talking to each other, say, yeah, this happened, or you lost a big customer, or COVID, or, you know, uh, we have a softness in the economy, you know, people get it. Things are not always great all the time. So you kind of have to just have that open dialogue you're doing you're adding that whole analyst type yeah function on a on an ongoing basis to kind of monitor these things right so that the owners are will be in a good position and even if some tragic event happens you've been in there you've helped them establish a plan so that if the sister or the cousin or the mother or the husband, whoever can step into a, um, the operations. And even though they may not ever been there, at least there's a structure. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, to have a strong, uh, tax department, a tax attorney, uh, that really understands how that works and, and, and you know, is, is, is involved in multiple transactions so that this is not missed, um, and is handled properly from the seller side. Um, and you know, it's a very complicated, like you said, the tax law is complicated. That's why no one wants to really focus on it. Uh, and that's why part of that trusted advisor group, you know, the guys like the investment bank, like ourselves, attorneys who do the M and a state and trust, uh, your CPA firm, et cetera, wealth management firm are critical to have really top notch advisors advising you. There's, there's hundreds of family offices out there looking to do their own deals, patient capital. They really don't want to exit long-term. So is that something you want to be involved with? You got these search funds. There's individuals that are back that come out of, you know, uh, Stanford or Princeton or Harvard. And they are, they have investors that they have lined up to help them buy one business that they're going to run. But when they get someone like you under LOI, they have to go back to their investors and pass the hat to see whether or not they want to invest with this company. And so the buyer or buyers in this case, who said, okay, is that sustainable, right? That's the question. Is that sustainable? So from a, and you're going to raise that question from a, from a buy side. You know, and, you, and the answer is not, yes, it's sustainable. It's like, show me, right? Show me how it's sustainable. Why, so in this case, 
you know, and, and you may have some other examples, we were able to show that out of the 5,000 new customers that they picked up during this, uh, you know, this, this COVID period, 80% stayed with the business for other needs, new, ac- new client, new cl- customer acquisitions, right? So that gave comfort to, to, to you as, as a buy side advisor and to the, the client, your client, of course, that, you know, we, we are, we're comfortable with that. You know, for our audience, for business owners out there, I think it's critical, you know, people, you know, typically don't like to spend money on professional services, right? Uh, some do, do, but it's really an investment. You're making this investment to help you long-term, you know, save you money. So if I can invest X dollars today, that's going to save me Y. Look, you got to re- look at it as your return on your investment versus a cost. And it, it makes complete sense to sit down with someone like yourself and look at your, your various options, which, I mean, you guys do every day, especially in manufacturing, you know, and... And you're probably with well, your current client is dealing with that every day, but mm. it's like, okay, when and how much do I pass along to my customer? And we've had customers that tried to hold the margin, hold the price because they had pretty good margin for you know six months and said like, I, I, I got to pass it on now. So all of a sudden their margin was made to 65% margins down at about 52. Mm. The first question the buyers, well, why is your margin off? So, well, I was delaying passing along the price increases because, you know, I'm afraid about losing the business or I'm, you know, it's been a long-term customer. I'm trying to work with them. You know, it's our relationship. It's a business decision, right? But to your point is that that's a constant hot button yeah. because the devil's in the details. And when we, you know, get into diligence to your point, the buyer, the transaction services group is going to want to see a, a margin and product SKU margin analysis, product line margin analysis, mm-hmm. uh, where the margin's been, you know, how much is commodity driven? Because your margins are up, your prices are up because mm-hmm. of commodities, but so your sales are up, but what's what's driving that? Is that really new business? Mm-hmm. Or is that because you raised your prices because of right. your cost went up? And who's the best buyer for my business? Who creates the best value? I mean, your phones are ringing, the emails are coming. I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples. And we have a client that we sold a couple of years ago. And before he signed up with us, he was in negotiations with a buyer for almost a year. I called him up based on a referral. He says, hey, I got a buyer lined up. I said, okay. And I asked him a lot of questions. I said, great for you. But, you know, this is just from my perspective, my experience. Do they have the wherewithal to do the deal? What value are they bringing to the table? Um, are they, is the offer of market value? Is it in current market? Are they looking to buy you at an opportunistic buyer at a discount to market? You know, when are you scheduled to close? And he really couldn't answer those questions. And so this kind of dragged on literally for almost a year. What's the one thing I need to do to prepare my company for sale? And his response was, this is typical Philip, get your financial house in order. You know, I couldn't say it better myself. That's number one, right? Get your financial house in order. And I was really, you know, really proud of him for saying that because he's learned from observing us and being involved in three, three and a half years that that's number one. If your financial house is not in order, you're not, you are at the mercy of the buyer retrading the deal to their benefit. So when you prepare for sale, Now's the time, whether you're doing it today, whether you want to go to market the first quarter of 2024, or you want to go to market 25 or even 26, make sure you're taking those steps. There's several techniques that will provide the cash flow. That's a big question for most of our clients and your clients is, will I have enough money post-sale to live the life I'm accustomed to, right? I don't want to short myself or my family. I also don't want to shift a huge portion of the proceeds of sale to whether it be federal or state taxes. And it's all about cash flow post-sale. And, you know, we're trying to avoid surprises, right? I mean, the key, the key, the key thing about planning is that you don't, and, and, and you don't you want to limit it to surprises in a transaction. So if a business owner is not thinking about this, uh, hasn't engaged with the right uh, trusted advisors like yourself or me, uh, and all of a sudden he gets to the table after spending a lot of money and he realizes he has a huge tax liability, 
you know, he may walk away because, hey, I, I can't do this because there's no money left for me or not enough left for me and my family. So what I'm hearing from you is, and, and of course, what's happening here is, is that you have, it's a family. So you're the second generation or third generation is thinking about, well, I'm just going to take the business o- over. My parents are going to give me the stock and, you know, but and their parents are saying, well, what am I going to live off of? Right. So what I'm hearing from you, and these are, again, these are, these are, these are favorable um, elements of the tax code that could be implemented. 